Right. Um, ordinarily, I guess you'd start a presentation like this with an intro, but that's a little redundant. <laughs> so why don't you just dive in? Uh, what I wanted to show everybody today is a uh, uh, collaborative Teams application built on Canvas apps, uh, leveraging responsive Canvas apps concepts, as well as Teams uh, app design um, uh, and manifest uh, structure. We're going to go through each of the steps along the way, kind of at a high level on each one. We're not going to get down uh, too, too deep. Uh, but after this call, I'm going to be uh, if, if everybody likes the app that I'm building, I'll just put it post it up on in a blog on the community, so everybody can have access to a solution file that includes the app and and the and the and the manifest definition in a repo somewhere, so that you guys can deploy the same thing. All right, um, so we're going to go through a few different things. I'm going to just do I like I like to do bottom line up front. Um, I used to be a Microsoft employee, so I I, I, I believe in the bluff. Uh, we're going to start with the demo or show what it looks like. Uh, this is what we're going to try and build, and then we'll step back and we'll go through it step by step by step um, and actually construct that thing one piece at a time. Uh, the scenario here is uh, you're, a, you're a part of a sales team. You're a sales rep on a team, and uh, as, as is the nature of, well, really any team, so it's not specific to sales, um, you get together with your team periodically, usually in teams. Your sales manager will ask you for updates on your opportunities that you're running um, and ask you questions about it. You, you say it's a 50% P win, but I don't know. You haven't had a call with that person in two weeks. Uh, you say it's worth $50,000, but I don't know. I think it's maybe more like $30,000. And you go down the line, each person going up and defending their piece. Um, this often happens in the blind, in the real world, right? And this is not specific to sales teams. It's every kind of team has something like this. Developers do this in daily stand-ups and, and accounts do it in charrettes and uh, and, and architects do it, and, you know, like all different kinds of professions do this kind of thing, and they do it in the blind. They'll be on a team's call where all they're looking at are each, other, are each other's skittles, right? And somewhere out there, a manager is looking at some screen with some piece of information or nobody really knows what it is, and we can do better. We can build something dynamic and interactive, and that's what we're going to do today. All right, so let's jump right into that demonstration. Let's say that we are... Uh, Let's say that we're in that sales meeting right now. This is Teams running in a browser, right? Uh, just because I'm in the Teams meeting here in the Teams meeting. So I have to use two different Teams interfaces. So please kindly ignore the browser piece. Uh, actually, you know what I can do? Go. I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, what we've added in here is a meeting inside the team. She's my test meeting app, and you can see it in the right side panel. Over here on the side panel, you can see a filtered list of opportunities that are filtered down to me. There's just the opportunities that I own in this sales team. I can look at my opportunities, right? I can pick either one of them. And if I need to, all the fields come up down here so that I can update things. We're in the middle, middle of the meeting. I know my boss is going to grill me because I haven't sent an email to this, this client in three weeks. I'm just going to go ahead and downgrade the people in right now before he gives me a hard time. No problem. And I can do this because, you know, I'm a lazy salesperson. I didn't do it yesterday. Now I'm in the meeting and I remember I have to do it. We do it real time. And this alone is already a pretty big value add. Just the ability to put this pain in the side is already a big help to anybody that's doing this. But what I don't see is what my manager is looking at. Right? I don't see that piece. I'm only looking at my piece. I'm not looking at something that's shared with the entire team. So that's where we take it the next step. We take this same app and we just put it out to share. This is what the manager experience would be. The manager shares out that exact same app. And because we're using responsive app design, we can actually restructure everything that's in the app, change what's being shown, and rearrange those apps. So now we're looking at all open opportunities. We have a little chart of some kind that's looking at the revenue forecast. And this is what the manager is going to be able to walk people through at the same time. While I as a user, I'm still looking at my set. And if I'm running a little bit behind, maybe I came in five minutes late to the meeting, I still have time. I still have access to update my opportunities in real time and get those, get those results to reflect on the screen. Any questions about that? It's a pretty straightforward visual, right? The question before we get into actually how is this thing made? So the collaborative, the collaborative part will show up, like you'll be able to see that visually. Um, once you make your edits, it'll show up on the manager view. Will they be seeing? Be not, not only only if you set the refresh cycle. Oh, the manager setting a refresh cycle. Got it. Got it. You can't force a refresh in the manager's app, app interface. Although 
there is there are signal RPCFs that people have built that can do that. Um, I just you know well, you're that, that's a bit more of a, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. of a of a step up in, in complexity. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's take a look then at how this is built. We'll start with a few uh, basic pieces, right? We're going to talk a little bit about Teams app concepts, right? What are what are the things that make up a Teams app? What where do they get deployed? And what are the definitional terms? Then we'll talk about some of the responsive design tips. How did that side panel turn into a, a more a, a, something that looks very different, but it's the exact same app, right? Um, we'll talk about adding uh, Canvas app to Teams, and then we'll talk about adding Canvas app to Teams meetings specifically because it's a very different beast. It's a very very different beast. And we can just, you know, have a discussion, ask any questions you want after, after we're done. All right, so let's talk about a Teams app. A Teams app itself is actually an extremely simple thing. Uh, a Teams app is actually only about three files. That's it. Um, it's a manifest XML. Um, it's an icon. And it's a second icon. There you go. And if you, you put together a zip file with those three things, you have just made a Teams app. Um, and you can have that Teams app point at www.google.com. And it will work. You will load Google in whatever that experience is, right? That's all a Teams app is. It's much like a, a lot of uh, M365 apps, uh, Outlook apps, Word apps, uh, Excel apps, PowerPoint, all those add-ins that come into silo of add-ins, all the same thing, right? They all make a basic manifest file that has a pointer to a web location, and that's what we're going to load in that side name. Uh, but within that manifest, what goes into the XML is very important. Right? The XML is not just one node, it's a URL. It's also a lot of information about the app context. Context being where in Teams can this thing surface, right? It's information about the app permissions, which are permissions that actually get, but the, the app cannot take certain actions without you putting those nodes into permissions. And when it is installed, an administrator is notified of those permissions actions, right? So for example, the ability for me to share to what they call stage, that the share button there is a special permission that has to go into the manifest. When an administrator is approving it, an M365 administrator is approving it, it will tell them this app can share to stage. Um, and then there are the, obviously the pointers to the web resource itself. Uh, app context uh, is basically uh, at a high level, it's the, you know, is it an app, like the left, navigation of teams, the, the, the buttons that are there on the left side. Can it be in a tab in a meeting or a channel or wherever? Can it be in a chat? Can it be in a meeting at a high level? And then there's more nodes underneath that. We'll, we'll get to more specifics later. All right, so let's jump into a little bit of the responsive design information. Um, a few basic generic elements that you can get a much better walkthrough by Googling this stuff and, and you're going to get from me in, in five minutes. Um, if you just Google, I don't know, Reza Durrani responsive Canvas apps, you're going to get a much better YouTube video than I can I can give you here in a few minutes. Also, April Dunham. April Dunham does a phenomenal job. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I've got a few things that are up here on the screen, but what's, I think what's more important for the purposes of my presentation here is what you saw in that demo, and I'll, I'll go back to the demo here for a second, is not only responsive app design, but also... I don't know, there isn't really a, a proper word for this, but I'll call it contextual app design, right? Um, we're, we are using responsive elements that restructure, say, this gallery of opportunities from one column to two or to three, depending on how wide your screen is. We're using responsive elements that move around the uh, form that, that, that shows up if you click on an opportunity. Um, but we're also using more context-aware elements that are not really, it's not really principles of responsive design that will conditionally display a chart, for example, depending on how wide the display is. Um, so I wouldn't call that what's going on with the chart there responsive design, or the filtering, right, my opportunities and all open opportunities. It's not responsive design, but it's in the same wheelhouse. We're trying to build the app so it's, it's, it's context aware and can respond to those things. So let's take a look at that app and some of the items that are in it. Uh, here is my sales collaboration app. All 
All right, so as you can see, started with just a uh, vertical oriented sort of mobile layout app. Um, and all we're doing is we're just using in here some responsive elements, specifically the, um, the canvas element that comes up with scrollable design. If you guys are not aware of this one, um, it's an out-of-the-box-ish component. If you pick the template scrollable, um, there's the, this question mark element called canvas shows up in there. Um, and you can copy that out, put it into your own app. What it gives you is a horizontally responsive, vertically scrollable element, uh, which is very nice. <laughs> How did that gallery go from one column to two? And if this was a bigger, wider screen to three to four to five uh, columns, that's that canvas, right? The same thing happens with form and, and so on. Okay. Within that canvas, we nest data cards. Within the data cards, we host elements like the gallery and so on, right? Some of these uh, elements here, other form. So many containers and containers and containers. All right. Oh, well, this is this is kind of one of the other points, right? Containers and containers. Um, when you're building, I think, any any Canvas app these days, everything goes in containers and containers and containers. There's really no exception to that. But in responsive design, doubly so. And, and in this, this idea that I'm kind of nebulously referring to, like contextual design, uh, triply so, right? You want to be able to hide and show components conditionally based upon the width of the display view. Um, this is kind of critical, right? Having containers in, uh, that you can work with is indispensable. Show. Here you go. So here is the uh, that chart, right? And we can look at the visibility on that chart. This is kind of that contextually relevant piece. That's all I'm doing, right? If the parent width of the of the view is greater than 800, right? Show the chart, right? That means there's room for it. And because we're using um, responsive design, we're moving elements around as the view increases. That we know if the width is greater than 800, there's enough room for it. All right, um, so let's back up to the slides here. Any questions before I move on about, I went through a little bit about team submission. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have one. Um, so when you're in the canvas there, how do you resize that so you can get a sense of what it looks like at the different, uh, the different width? Excellent question, excellent question. You just hit play. If you're not aware of the preview display, this started what, six or six months? In the last year, in the last year, they started giving, the, the, the previous display started giving you form factor options. So you can go like this. I have it going full screen browser by default, and that's how that's on testing a very, very wide screen. But we could do, you know, go to canvas size, right? We can test it as though it was on a tablet, right? Like an Apple iPad Pro here and you can see what it would look like in all those different form factors and that's how you you test it um i feel like the when i was doing testing uh initially the ipad pro 11 was kind of about what teams windows were sizing out on my monitor so that's what i was using to test uh, but i also used the full screen one because i had thought that uh the presentation here is going to be extremely high res so i was trying to plan for that <laughs> so when you do this you can't change it in like you can't drag to resize you have to you have to kind of save it and then go into the preview each time. Yeah, yeah, kind of got to do it on a little bit of faith. Yeah, okay. yeah you got to look at it, go, okay, I think it's the sizing of the gallery that's wrong, but it could be the container it's in. Let me go check that out. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Is so responsive you so much. design coming for Canvas apps? I uh, remember seeing that in release notes, but I don't know. Piece by piece, right? I'm glad I work in model-driven apps. Bit by bit by <laughs> bit, we are we are we are getting there, right? Um, and, and I think that that's the reason why some half-baked components like that canvas thing, yeah, aren't fully baked components, is because you know they got put out there as templates. It was a let's give this a try and see if people like it. And I, my guess is the product group looked at them and said, hey, we can do better. Yeah. Can you remind me again how you got that Canvas component that you put yeah, in there? Yeah, absolutely. So, is that like an out of the box one? It's out of the box ish. Okay. Like out, out of the box esque. Gotcha. So if we if we go over here and we hit a new screen on this app, 
we go to our templates. Okay. These templates uh, include, uh, among them are a few fancy magical things that Microsoft has put in there that are not listed in the uh, in components otherwise. Uh, specifically in the scrollable component, scrollable template as this, that includes that canvas mm -hmm. thing in it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also with all your UI controls or components that come with uh, Canvas apps, there are containers. So there are vertical containers, horizontal containers, all those different things. And you start to specify sizing. Theoretically, the idea there is you would specify formulas to control the sizing, which is what then gives you the responsive nature in your application. So everything that Charles is talking about here is 100% correct. When we start to think about responsive design, we start thinking about the, um, the devices that a user might work on. But the other thing we have to take into that uh, into account there, as Charles pointed out, is this concept of context. What are the things in my app that don't make sense when I'm working on a phone versus working in a traditional browser, right? Because the phone with limited real estate, some things are harder. I want big chunky buttons, right? Those types of things. So that all starts to play into the responsive nature of your application as well. Any other questions about the, the app design? I mean, while we're here, happy to walk through more of it. So you so in your app, when you're looking to put it in teams, you kind of made an estimate in terms of what sort of device I think that Teams window will look like and, and said, let me test it out this way and see what it looks like it, mm -hmm. just to get a test for the look and feel. Yeah, and, and, and really because it's idea. responsive, let me come back to the, the Teams app, because it's responsive, it does. I don't need to get it exact. I don't need to be precise, right? If this window size changes, because we're using different responsive elements, mm -hmm. it'll resize. Really good idea. So that gets down to the skinniest area, right? And it can cast that down. Cool. Yeah, it gets up to here. Or if I uh, hide the side pane, right? It can, it can adapt to all those changes. All right. Um, so let's talk about uh, the next piece. How do we get? How do we get from a Canvas app into Teams? Um, the importing a Canvas app from Teams, this is, the, um, this is exactly what, what any Microsoft sales rep will tell you, is the easiest thing in the world. It's a one-click process. You just select your app and click Add to Teams. It'll work every time. <laughs> asterisk. Asterisk. <laughs> asterisk. Um, so that is true. If you go in uh, and from your list of apps, pick your app, and then click the Add to Teams button, you can deploy straight to Teams from there. Uh, if from in a solution, if you pick an app, there's an Add to Teams button that's kind of hidden in the three dots, but it's there, uh, and you can deploy your app straight to Teams from there. Um, and you can also export the app to generate the manifest that we're going to talk about in a little bit here, so you can see that manifest in the middle. Um, and that's nice. It's all well and good. Here's the problem. That manifest is written uh, in the background with certain assumptions. And the main assumption there being that you're going to use this one way, and only one way, going back to app context, the, the concept I brought up at the beginning, which is as an app or a tab. That's it. That's the only way if you use these buttons to deploy to Teams, the app that you deploy to Teams will only be relevant as an app or a tab. So you can put in that left navigation or you can put in a, in a, in a, in a Teams, in a channel tab, but you can't put it anywhere else. Or you can't put it into a chat, you can't put it into a meeting, things like that. Um, why is that the case? Well, turns out that when that feature was added, the manifest uh, that Teams was working with was only version 1.8. And the Power Apps product team, you know, has other things to do other than going back and updating that feature every single time the Teams team updates their manifest definition. And so even though the manifest that they're generating is pretty good, it's just out of date and Teams no longer parses it correctly. Okay. So if you actually want to get more capabilities out of your Teams app, the correct way to do it is to hit that Add to Teams button and then download the manifest, and you have to edit the manifest file manually. We're going to, get, we're going to look at them side by side in a second, but there's 
four major areas that are most important ones that need to be edited. Uh, the manifest version, which is 1.8 and what will be exported from Teams um, or from, from, from Power Apps. Hopefully, very soon, somebody's going to hear about this. And, you know, suddenly, it'll be 1.16, which is what it has to go to, 1.16. Um, so you have to update that. You have to update the URL link to the manifest definition. Uh, you have to update the context to give it the values you want. Like, I want it to show up in meetings. I want it to show up in chats. Um, and then you have to update meeting surfaces. Surfaces is a node inside of context. I mentioned that there's stuff inside of context. Surface is like the physical space in that context where it should show up, side pane, full screen, things like that. Uh, and then authorization, which are the permissions that the app needs, i.e. the ability to share. Right, so let's take a look at some of those manifest files. So off the side. All right. So on the left side of your screen, we've got uh, the manifest file as generated uh, by Power Apps. On the right side, you've got the manifest file as I had to update it in order to make it work here. If I'm getting too deep down in the weeds, people, you know, try and try and bear with me. It, it's not going to last too much longer. Um, but I want to point out a few of the areas need to be updated. The schema definition URL needs to be updated. Uh, and that's pretty easy to find. Just Google uh, Teams app manifest version 1.16, and you know that 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 site will come up. It's not hard to find. Um, this one, the one that's that's by default exported, you can see in the URL is referencing 1.8, right? And uh, what we need to do is we need to update it to reference 1.16. All right, uh, we need to update our context to add the meeting details tab and the meeting chat tab. The meeting details tab is the is the tab in the meeting. If you ever have double clicked on a Teams meeting in Teams, like in the calendar, and it opens up a window that's not the team, it's just information about the meeting. Uh, that's the meeting it has its own thing, like a channel, and you can install apps in there, so you can, in theory, build apps that are for preparing for a meeting as well as having it in the meeting, right? And you can have that con contextual information as well. So that's available in the Teams integration object. I'm going to go into Maybe we'll have time at the end to talk about the Teams integration object as well. Um, but th that is a possibility as well. So you could have an app that is, um, has, serves three purposes in a meeting. Preparing for the meeting, um, live interaction in the meeting, and then sharing in the meeting. All right. And uh, so then I've also got it in here for chat tabs because I was doing a little bit of uh, testing. But those are not necessary, right? If you're just going to do the meeting one, you can just get rid of those. Uh, the other one that I've got added in here is the meeting stage, which is it ability to go into the stage and right? it's just the main sharing area. The meeting surfaces, this is part of why the manifest needs to be updated from 1.8 to 1.16. It did not have a concept of surfaces, and that's why you can't get um, meetings, a side panel or stage uh, in the 1.8 manifest. Um, you have to add surfaces and add both side panel and stage. Um, then we get into See here, the manifest version is down here. That has to update to 1.16. Um, and down here, we have the authorization section, which just lists you know, we're requesting specific permissions. I mentioned before, uh, all this does is um, put the request inside the app uh, as you upload it. If you, are a, if you are not a global admin or an M365 admin, when you upload a Teams app, it goes in as a request to deploy the environment. And then your admin sees that request and will see these permissions listed in there. Uh, you're, you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's an app. It goes in meetings. It'll go to the meeting stage, and you need the, the ability to write to chat. Okay, no problem. All right. Um, so those are the major updates that need to happen in the manifests, and that's that's it. After that, um, all you need to do is deploy to Teams from the apps area or from a here. If you are an M365 admin, I get to play God and be right now. Now, not everybody is, but an M365 or global admin can come into the Teams apps, into Manage apps, and just upload it directly and not have to ask anybody's permission, just do it, right? Once the app has been uploaded and approved, or in the case of an admin, just uploaded, 
it then shows up for everybody. It's just there. Um, you can change org-wide app settings to filter at who apps appear to. But if you're following this pattern using Canvas apps, it's pretty easy to trim that with Canvas app permissions, with app, you know, app sharing or with data source permissions and other things. And so I don't know if, if I would ever go this far as to try and make the app not appear for people. And I don't care if it shows up, you can't use it. That kind of thing. That's just within like the marketplace, right? It doesn't necessarily go to their pane, or I guess it could go to the site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, okay. when a user goes to the apps area and says, I'd like to add an app, That's what you can saying. use this to trim it out Got so it. it doesn't show up for them. But also if your if your data source is trimming them out or or if, they, if the app has never been shared with them, then it's not going to do them any good if they can see that it's there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and that is that. I think I'm done a lot. A lot of head schedule here. <laughs> Went a little, a little fast, huh? Charles, you just target. mentioned about sharing the app. I see customers doing that two different ways. What you just said is, you know, as the developer, I might be thinking about, well, I can manage the permissions from the Power Platform side, right? Mm -hmm. Some customers look at it from the other end and they're saying, well, okay, my team's administrators are going to define who has access to which apps. So anytime I'm going to publish an app to teams or I'm going to making the assumption that we're not talking about Dataverse for teams, anytime I'm going to take a, you know, a full power, uh, power app and, and um, make that available in teams, my team's administrators will create a policy in teams to say, what groups are allowed to access that app? Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, depending on the way your organization or your customers, depending on your role, right? Depending on the way people want to manage that kind of access, you can look at it from both ways. Yeah. Um, best advice that, that I have there is have somebody who knows about who specializes in power apps and got the power apps governance, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, design your governance, know where your security is going to be. Don't just guess, right? Make those decisions up front. Um, because if you're if you're expecting your admin to be responsible for it, probably not the best way to, to go about things. Right. Admins are busy people. All right, any questions about deploying to the app team, the app uh, catalog, or anybody want to look more at the app or at teams options that um schema like 1.16 you go there i guess there's documentation obviously we'll find if we're trying to oh, i'm sure it's all yeah no no, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. no, no, no. there's absolutely no, no documentation okay. on <laughs> what no. you what you just saw is uh yeah. is the documentation the that i just yeah you just saw the documentation got it very yeah. cool I, sh I should probably write a blog. <laughs> I should have write a blog. <laughs> there is no documentation. Uh, that it. schema, is, you can find one one site that gives you that, that is a JSON document that includes every single element in the schema so. and okay. and a <clears throat> and a five to eight word definition of that element. That's, that's the. It. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I, I can find that. I'll find that thing for you. Actually, you know what? Uh, it's actually in the manifest. Hold on. Okay. Oh, That's what this URL is at the top. Okay. So if we pick that URL, there you go. So that's the documentation. Okay. Uh, you want to copy and paste that into the chat? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, here. Put it into the chat. It's not the easiest thing to use, to use but. Um, but it, it, it works. I got there. I got there using that. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> I've been I've been scolded by James. Yes, you can also use Bing. You do not use Bing. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. You are correct. I wonder if Copilot's going to make any of this easier in the future. Um, I think uh, a lot of stuff becomes easier with that, right? Um, hopefully, uh, I believe, I believe, so Yeoman has a generator for Teams apps, right? There's a Yeoman Teams apps generator, um, which is very useful. Um, and you can you can also generate these manifest files using Yeoman. Um, and then you don't need to worry about manually editing all those things. What you need to worry about instead 
is getting your ID rights uh, for the app and the URL for the app and all the other things that are the pointers to that app. You need to go find those and put them into the, into the manifest that Yeoman generates. So you can start from either end. You're going to need to make the manual edits. But Yeoman, Yeoman at, least, at least you know that you're getting the latest uh, manifest definition. Use Yeoman. If anybody doesn't know what Yeoman is, Y-E-O-M-A-N, uh, or sorry, Y-O-M-A-N. It's not Y E O, it's Y O. <laughs> Yo, man. Um, and uh, yeah, it's used for generating uh, M365 apps of all kinds. Uh, you can use it to generate manifests for all your M365 apps. We are in Philly, so. Yeah, yo. Yo, man. Works. <laughs> <laughs> that John. <laughs> awesome. Thank all you, right. Carl. This was a great was awesome. demo and presentation. All right, good, good. Thank you. Yeah. Way is you ready, yours. sir? Okay. You know, can I just share my screen here on Teams without? Yeah. yeah. yeah that works. You don't want to stand at the podium. Save this move, probably. <laughs> 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 I'll just suggest. You can take your take your chances. Up here. Yeah. <laughs> it worked for you. Yeah. It's okay. Let me see if I didn't didn't like me earlier today. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yesterday was John Charles. That's really yeah, that's awesome, Charles. Through. Yeah, I'm in this path of just putting apps within our dynamics right now, but I think there's definitely interest in once we get people to see their information outside of dynamics directly, like that's super helpful. Yeah, that's not gonna work. Okay. That's all right. Um, but then to put apps into like outlook. Custom size. Yeah, look. The microphone is the same size. Same, 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 same yeah. size. Thank you. It'll it'll pick you up crystal clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we could hear you from uh, where you were sitting. Too. Oh no! Make him stand in the front. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Aww, he's laughs> <small. laughs> Okay, my safety spot. My safety spot. <laughs> <laughs> OK, a, a quick introduction to Azure Communication Services. Um, and this will be, uh, well, they will see how this goes. OK, Communication Services is, is why is it relevant to Dynamics and, and Power Platform? Uh, because so much of what we're doing is in Teams. Uh, teams is being built into Dynamics customer service. Um, and so ACS allows us, allows us to have situations where Teams is not a solution. For example, Teams and Dynamics are both really oriented towards uh, uh, people who are in an organization, people who have a license, people who pay for the product. But there's lots of situations where uh, you have an external user, you don't want them to have to install Teams, you don't want to bury the internet, you want to lower the friction level. And so ACS um, is, is a real cool solution. And um, it allows your employees, your, your, the people, your internal users to work in teams or work in dynamics and your external users to work in a variety of platforms. They can work in teams or they can work in a custom application that you can develop. Um, a scenario uh, would be uh, medical situations, um, government situations. Uh, and, and in the particular case I'm working with, um, we have um, young people who you want to log on anonymously and not not be part of your organization, uh, and and but you want to be able to communicate with them. You want to have a meeting with them, and so ACS is a really exciting um, tool that that, uh, that that I've gotten just recently discovered. And I'm I'm pretty excited about. It's always been around for a couple of years. Uh, what are the connectors? You can have uh, send receive SMS messages. You can use it to send out bulk SMS messages and, of course, response. Um, user identity identity preview. This allows you to allows um, to create a user, which is so. For example, for teams, a, a person can provide their own identity. Uh, they can have a third party identifier um, like. Um, Amazon, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Google, et cetera, or Microsoft, or you can create an identity for them. You can give it to them, give them a user access token. Uh, phone calls, 
Uh, incoming and outgoing, um, it allows routing and all kinds of things, uh, tools. You can set out mass calls, um, emails, send out emails, part of this, and then a chat, of course, which is sort of what we think of its default functionality. Other integrations, integrations, that seems like spelled funny. Okay, uh, WhatsApp, a video chat, AI chat, so that you can, uh, you know, it, Everything's now AI, so you can have people come in and chat with you. Uh, Power Automate um, and job router to message queues. And WhatsApp is extremely cool because it allows sort of people who are not team centric to to communicate with um, with you and to, you know, to interact with them. Yeah, like this is kind of saying the same thing over again. You, you can you, you, Microsoft 365 Teams Teams. A custom app to Teams, or you can have custom apps to custom apps. All of this is, uh, if, and underneath it is ACS. Power, and guess what? There are Power Platform controls, PCF controls coming out, which are relevant to us. Still vaporware. She looks so scared of the PCF <laughs> controls. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like, well, Microsoft has been promising it for a year. I still haven't seen it. Yeah. But. It's uh, there are PCF controls in in, in, the, in the pipeline, which would be relevant to us in the Power Platform. Um, but regardless, what are the costs? Um, ACS is built on a per minute usage. It's uh, 0 0.04 cents uh, uh, per minute. But it's, for example, the situation if somebody does a thousand forty five minute calls, um, it would be uh, one hundred eighty dollars a month, something like that. Um, but however, it gets a little more expensive than that because both audio and video are billed. And if you have a large group of people and doing audio and video and et cetera, so it, it's it's still relatively cheap, uh, you know, but over it, 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 it can add up. What do you need to get started? <clears throat> so you create an Azure communication service, you create an Azure communication service in Azure. Um, very easy to create. Um, takes, takes, you need to install Node.js and uh, you need to generate an identity uh, to, this is for the sample applications and I will, I will show you quickly uh, how, how that is done in the identity profile. It is very easy to do. Okay. So, here is my um, Azure, and I have, I'm going to generate a identity token for us, for me. I come here, click generate. This creates, a, you know, it's essentially creating a user. Um, I copy the identity uh, profile, and then I come over here, and this is, oh, so this is the Azure Communication User UI library. And this library is really cool. It has a lot of things. You can get started with this um, and, and get going. And the idea they have here is you can either use their tools as a composite tools, which is the whole thing, or you can use component tools, which are sort of uh, smaller chunks of, of information. Um, let me. Yeah, so he. Mm, <laughs> I need a script for a project. <laughs> I was working with open source libraries to build the chat window. Oh, Wait, put that back. Wait, put that back. <laughs> <laughs> Make a picture. Oh, uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So if we come here and uh, oh, okay. So I'm going to join this meeting here. From this, this is this is. This, I'll show you how the, how quick this is. So let me see if I can get make sure that I get one that is. One of the things that I've had problems with is seems it, it wants. Let's let's start with an anonymous in in private uh, new in private session. Uh, preview. Okay, so here I'm going to you put in the user identity token I just generated. 
so I will. That's my user identity token. Feel free to pirate it because it, it, it expires shortly. Um, and it's going to cost me point zero eight four cents a minute to steal my information. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Put <laughs> the camera out. Yes. <laughs> um, Okay, now the end communication endpoint. Um, I will show you. I will show you uh, what that is. It is here at this Philly user group. If I come here to keys, the I have, I've generated an endpoint uh, in here. So I'll go ahead and control C go over to get that in. Many windows open here. Okay. So if you're while you're doing that, if you're a dynamic CRM user, this is like an alternative to omnichannel type stuff. Then. No. No. This is what underpins omnichannel. Mm -hmm. Oh. Omnichannel uses ACS, and you have to set up ACS in order for omnichannel to work. So you can't you can't deploy omnichannel without ACS. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I'm not on the tech side. So this is. What you would do first? Would you do uh, this you, without on I mean, you, you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't be on this particular testing website. Yeah. You just deploy the resource and then give Omnichannel the resource information. So would you use this without Omnichannel? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Omnichannel is. Uh, is I mean, it, it's a, it's a way of putting this into Dynamics yeah. and and charging a license for it. <laughs> what do you really think about it? <laughs> I think it's a way of putting this into Dynamics and charging a license for it. <laughs> And good on the people that figure out how to add features and charge a license for it. Yep. I think we lost our Microsoft folks for that part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I sense a business model there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the demo gods kicked in. Uh, this worked ju yeah. just a minute ago. It's because you're, you're sharing screen. Yeah. Yeah. Pick oh, up okay. the screen share to load just fine. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it works. It works really. It works really quick. Let's see if I hear. Uh, and it allows allow essentially allows an external user. You can send them a link, and allows an external user to join in uh, a, a Teams meeting that that you have uh, without having to install Teams, without be, with being a website. It allows your users to use Teams in, in the environment they're familiar with, and external users to to come in and join. Be part of your organization and your your group and all that without without granting them access, without granting them an account, without making them guest user, without any you know without any of the, the issues of that of that nature. And it does work, and it works really cool. <laughs> okay, um, the other way to run it is you can run it in in. Um, in your own in, in um, your own system, your own application here, and here's an instance where I'm running it in PowerShell and uh, PowerShell cooperate with me. Too many, too many windows. Okay. So at this stage, if I control C, exit out and exit out, and then run it again. It, it gurgles and boom. Uh, and it's also an, a, another way to where you could run from a static, you can build your code and put it up, load up static Azure website, and again, have people <laughs> join your teams. If you're not aware, Azure static websites are basically free. There we go. And unless the volume, unless the usage volume gets very high, they are free, free. <laughs> and there I okay cool Bobby now Joe now this one did work. Welcome, so Bobby. So this one I am there I am. So I, I've joined the meeting. Oh, <laughs> 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 
But the cool thing is, I had all the control. Uh, let's see, if I, I had all the controls of mm -hmm. Teams. Yeah. I have a microphone, a camera. I can raise my hand. I can see you. Um, all of that, and it's just it's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, it's you know, it works. Um, so fun times. That's fantastic. And yeah. Did that so quickly too. Did that so quickly? Yep. It was wow. it was easy to do, um, and and here we are. So questions. <laughs> Shoot away because I don't know the answers. But <laughs> <laughs> how much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think we talked about that. It's oh. it's it, uh, uh, it's uh, four four cents. Four four cents a minute. Yes. <laughs> For, for, and for and, and oh and you can have you can have like I have a toll free number. Let me show you. Um, I have a toll free number for two dollars a month. Uh, wow. Plus the calling costs, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. Um, and it allows people to somewhere here. You can set up your own number that can ring your teams. Yep. Yeah. And here's here's a WhatsApp chat. You can chat with it. Um, you can set up um all kinds of um user identity and, and you have all, all um, I'm sorry, SDK and there's tons of documentation on it as you said I saw the UI stuff um there is let's see if we can come here quickly no I'm not gonna do that okay um so anyhow that is that so in your examples of medical gov like government I guess it depends on the scenario but like what's like how the, how is this like typically being shared? Is it like if someone has like a web portal or something? Is that generally how it's being shared out or? So correct. So you could send them a hot link mm -hmm. with the identity included in it so that when they they click that, they click that. It, okay. yeah, they, 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 they could come right yeah, in. I think like Teladoc scenarios or like. You know, correct, exactly. Teladoc. Yeah, okay. In, in, in the scenario I've been working in is um, welfare workers and they're working with uh, youth. And so you really want the barrier of, of you know, these they, these users are, are tech savvy, but they yep. may not have, Correct. you know, the thing. It's just, and so th this thing works on mobile, works on on a desktop, cool. um, and and you don't, we don't want them to be part. We don't want to give them an identity in in the team's environment and in the organization because then they can talk to each other. Like you can teams yeah. and and other people who are not related to them can talk to them so other people in an organization can reach out to the youth which is a liability issue yeah. and it's just all kinds of scenarios where you just you and, and hipaa you know you want to maintain their an anonymity yeah. you don't want and so this is it, it just it's a really it, it just solves a, a lot of problems that, that teams for adults and and people who are trusted in your organization you don't have those issues that you that, that you do and banking would be another scenario yes yep. you mentioned power automate have you done any work with this in the connectors i have not they each have a separate connector i was just looking at mm -hmm. so there's a completely separate connector for chat email identity sms and sms events yes and they all look pretty cool charles did you do something with um queuing in this or something yeah i've I, I used acs i used acs for a uh, federal call, uh, call center for at dhs uh, we built out an ACS prototype um, for uh, for helping them to um, to do automated handling. So mm -hmm. before it was Copilot Studio, um, we plugged ACS up to uh, up to a bot that we made for them, um, so that when people hit their phone line, uh, instead of just ringing straight to a person, <laughs> it would take them to a bot first. Mm -hmm. And the bot and, and and we use voice recognition service as well to take their spoken word into text and pass it to the bot and the bot's text and wow. and, and and turn it to voice. So they were having a conversation. That is a slick use of what used to be known as power virtual agents. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they worked really well. It worked wow. very, very well. And it required almost no code. Wow. Yep. That's a cool use case. Is anyone on the call using this today? No, that's why we're all listening to David teach us. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, but you, you you marry that up with today's Copilot Studio, right? And and you could have a an extremely convincing agent like experience. Very convincing. So as we know, Learn is just an amazing product. Um, it, it has yeah, very simple, easy to use, quick examples. Get you get you started. 
Um, again, the storybook, which is the it's the GitHub. If you Google um, uh, ACS uh, UI library, you'll get you'll end up there. And I'm going to any since we have thunderous silence of the questions. Um, I'm going to pivot topic and second topic briefly. I want to ask you about that UI library. What what else with this we just saw? Yeah, is that it? Was that were those all React components? Yes, those were all React components. Yes. So so another good thing that that cascades because I've never seen that UI library, but if they're all React components, it'd be pretty. It'd be really quick and easy to make a PCF. And is that experience that you were just okay. showing? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're gonna get a PCF that does it, then you can drop that into a Power Pages app without having yeah. to write whole your a whole ton of like liquid and all their nonsense. Mm -hmm. Just take their components, make a PCF, put it into your Power Pages behind a login, and then your customers can have a video call experience with your agents. Uh -huh. Someone was a Marvel fan on that earlier case. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, so there's the, you, you have the individual components, all these individual components, and you have the composite controls, which are up here. Yeah, that's fantastic. And either, you know, either one, either way you go, um, you know, the code's right here, you just grab it, import it. And, yeah. and there's a lot, Microsoft has a lot of these UI libraries hiding out there that are completely undiscoverable, even on Bing. There you go. Uh, even on Bing, on especially the, on Bing. He's going to find them on the right uh, doc, you find the right a link on the right documentation page. Yeah, there gonna, is there I, is an M three sixty five admin controls UI library that is all of the the weird UI that's almost fluent but not really in all the M three sixty five admin pages. Yeah, right. they have they made their own like they made their they own, own language. Yes, yeah. never fails. Okay, um, and then pivot topic slightly quickly. Uh, talk about there is a new way of getting certified, and I happen to have uh, Charles and uh, myself and I did work a little bit on credentialing. Um, but this is called applied skills credentials, and it, it's really interesting. It's a new type of credentials. Um, you can um, it, and instead of asking you a bunch of trivia pursuit questions, you actually go through and do uh, you, you do the training and then you do a practical exam. The exam's open book. Um, you can retake the exam and the cost is free. Hmm. Um, go to le learn Microsoft.com credentials and you'll find out about it. Um, I, there is currently a credential for the Canvas apps. And model-driven apps will be coming out. I don't know when, but shortly. Uh, the, the we the we built the the test for it, but yeah, the, the training hasn't been done. But and there's a whole bunch of other topics. If you're interested in it, just go check it out. That's just something I that I it, it was briefly mentioned in at Ignite, but but it didn't get a lot of traction. And so I thought it would be interesting to. To point that out to people, if you have been the barrier to the entry to get your credentials is the cost and the fear of spending all that money and not passing the test. Well, talk to your therapist about it. <laughs> As my therapist likes to tell, say, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good call out. I like that. Time's up. 